Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve, eh? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, the last few days, I've been waking up at all times in the night, and just this phrase keeps kept coming to me over and over and over again. Oasis in the desert. An oasis in the desert. If I'm pronouncing the word right, oasis. O-A-S-I-S. Oasis. Oasis in the desert. And I was really wondering, what's this? I heard about an oasis, but I was not quite sure exactly what it was. And so I went, I checked the dictionary, meaning of that, and it says, in a dry and barren land or a place where it's, there's a desert, when there's a water spring or water supply coming through that place, that's called an oasis in the desert. Now, you know, either typically, a place where there is an oasis, there is grass, there are trees, and a town or a little city de develops in that place. So I was thinking, what is this Lord? What are you trying to tell me through this? And it developed, over a period of time, it developed into a sermon. And I'm really excited to share the word with you all this morning. Because I'm sure you're going to enjoy, you're going to enjoy what the Lord has, has for us today. So let me read what I wrote here. An oasis in the desert. Oasis equals a place where there is water and therefore plants and trees. An oasis equals a, a place where there is water, therefore there are plants and trees. Now before we go any further, I want to welcome all those who are watching us on the live webcast. God bless you, wherever you are watching us from. Can you give them a big shout? Really loud, really loud. Not that's not loud enough. Praise God, praise God. I had a message from my friend in the States. He was watching it uh, from o o Toledo, Ohio. I think it is there where he lives. So Richard, if you're watching us, God bless your brother and Marlene and his family by the watching us. Also, Kat and Stuart watching us from Margaret River. They watched us last time. Welcome you all. Praise God. So there are people watching us all over. I realized that there were 675 people who have watched us last webcast, so which is encouraging, isn't it? So we're just not a church here, we're a church which reaches to the nations through the webcast, which is wonderful, praise God. So an oasis is a place where there is water and there are trees and plants. The trees and plants grow. A village or a town springs up. Isaiah verse 50, chapter 58, verse 11 says, the Lord will guide you always and satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. A calm and pleasant place in the middle of a busy and unpleasant surrounding. That's another meaning. In the dictionary, this is another meaning to an oasis. A calm and a pleasant place in the midst of busyness and uh, uh, unpleasantness in the surroundings. Now, I believe Jesus is calling us as a church, <coughs> as his people, to be an oasis in a world which is dry and barren. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Like, for example, some people, you know, I, I say this, when you go home, if you had a hard day at work, you want your home to be an oasis calm and a peaceful place where you know you can go and rest and enjoy. Some people have to go away for a season to enjoy that peace and that happiness or quietness. So an oasis is two meanings, two real meanings. One is a place where it's a dry and barren land, where there's water springing up. Another thing, the other meaning is a, a place where there is a lot of busyness, a lot of unpleasantness, but because Jesus lives inside, you, you become a peaceful place and that's like an oasis. Now, in, in life's journey, very often, we go through various dry times and various situations. So let's bring it to our own lives and let's look at the Bible to see how, what does this really mean? What does this really mean? Water 
is a very clear symbol of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, water is a clear symbol of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When look at 2 Chronicles 7.14, we read the verses there, it says, When I shut up the heavens, and there is no rain, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn away from their wicked ways and seek my face, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And what that means is that when a nation is in dryness, when a nation is in barren, if the children of God will turn away and seek his face, we are able to create an oasis in amongst the dryness. Now let's look at, uh, I want to sing this beautiful song. And I'm going to ask, maybe Ruben, can you play the guitar for me? Steve, are you here? Come, brother. The woman at the well. You know that song, right? There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain which fills yes, yes. Now she mm -hmm. there, there came a thirsty woman who was drawing from a well her life it was wrecked it was ruined her soul was bound for hell but there she met the master who told her of her sin and if she'll drink these waters, she'll never thirst again. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain. That fills with God's great love. Come to the waters. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall run dry. Sing it again. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain that's filled with God's great love. There is a river that never shall run dry. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There is a river which will never shall run, never shall run dry. Praise God. So we read in John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verse 1. Verse, let's take it from verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sinca. In the plot of ground Jacob had given to the son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about six. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came... To draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How come you ask me for a drink? 
for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, to, said You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flock and her herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up into eternal life. So here we see an amazing encounter. Jesus, being a Jew, with his disciples come to a place through Samaria. He comes to a well, which is Jacob's well. And he stops there and he tells them, I, I, Jesus, I believe, knew what was going to happen. He tells the disciples to go and get something for them. So they, all the disciples are gone. Jesus is all alone. And he, it's a dry and barren land. They're walking through the desert. He sees a well. There's water there. And he basically says, meets this woman comes to get some water, a Samaritan woman. He says, can you get me a drink of water? And the woman says, how come you are asking me for water when you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan? And the conversation starts up there and Jesus basically tells her, if you know who is talking to you, I can give you water which is everlasting, not, not what is going to dry up. Now when you look at this, when you look at this amazing picture, Jesus creates an atmosphere for someone to come close to him. And identically or typically for the rice words here, when you're walking in the presence of the Lord, you are a walking oasis. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Every one of you who is a child of God, when you spend presence, time in the presence of the Lord, you turn into be a well, welling up with water, which is eternal life. Now Jesus comes and meets this woman, and when he meets a woman, he breaks every tradition, religion, all the systems of the world. Because what happens is he basically says, I've come to give life and give it more abundantly. And the woman says, how can I drink? How can you draw water? You can't draw water. You don't have anything. He says, I'll give you water which will never run dry. Let's, let's read the rest of it. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't, thirst, I won't be thirsty. And have to keep coming to this to draw water. He told her, go and call your husband and come back. Jesus said to her, you are right. You are right. When you say you have no husband, did I miss something there? 17, I have no husband, she replied, yeah, sorry. Jesus said to her, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite right. So, Jesus enters the atmosphere, comes into the place and he talks to this woman and she says, I know what you are going through, I know your problems, I know that you, are not, you don't have a husband because you have had five husbands, you are in trouble. In other words, this woman was in a place of dryness. This woman needed Jesus. And she comes into a place of an encounter in the natural, but it turns into a supernatural encounter. Wherever there is a barren land, God can take us into that place and turn it into an oasis for the kingdom of God. How many of you have been to Israel? Okay, if you go to Israel, one of the things you will find out is when you're flying or when you're driving, the land is all dry, 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 dry. It's just, it's just like parched land, particularly when you're coming through Jordan or some other location. But as you hit Israeli territory, it's green. Am I right? It's amazing. It's green. So Israel is an oasis in a barren and a desert land. Now why is Israel so rich. Why is Israel so blossoming with green? 
Because the presence of God is on that land. I, 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 went, I went into the internet and got this. I think I'll read this for you. Oasis in the desert. Water is a key source of tensions in the Middle East. Now at last, Palestinian, Jordanian and Israeli scientists are working together to resolve it. Clean water is com a commodity that we take for granted in most developed world, in most developed world. But for much of the population in Africa, Asia and the Middle East, water or more accurately, the lack of it defines people's lives. Whether they are forced to what's the word E K E Ek? Eek out of living through this uh, subs subs subsistence, subsistence farming, or to cook and bathe in filthy water, the results are the same. Poverty, disease, famine, and war. So what we are seeing here is that water has been a very important element for people to do, live, be alive. Where there is no water, there is trouble. There has been a lot of fighting in the regions of Israel and the border towns there. And I was thinking of this and I thought, wow, Bathsheba. Isn't it interesting? The water wells of Bathsheba was protected. Or what do you call it? Uh, the Ottoman Turks were safeguarding it because there was no water in the whole region. And yet Israel, Bathsheba had water. The water wells. And uh, this year marks 100 years since... Uh, Ottoman Turks were defeated and the Australian troops along with other troops broke through the defense lines and captured those water wells and brought in a water supply. So water turns a desert land into an oasis. Likewise, when we stand for Jesus as people of God, we can turn any desert land into an oasis. When you walk in, the atmosphere needs to change. When you walk in, the atmosphere needs to change. Where is your oasis? Your oasis can change as the Holy Spirit leads you according to your circumstances. Now there can be various things can, we can look at to see how a person can be used by God. How can you be an oasis? Look at the prodigal son. A prodigal son, when he left his father's house, he had a um, wonderful supply of everything at his father's house. But when he walked away from his father's house and he walked in messed up with his friends. He comes to a place where he has no money, he has no food, he has nothing to eat, nothing to, no, no place to go to. He ends up looking after pigs. Right? Now, I, I hope I, I want to get this message across. I hope I get it across properly. Uh, your circumstances can change and your oasis can change. In other words, when you have, when you are living in a rich country like Australia, we have what? Chocolates, milk, honey, ice cream, everything, right? Yeah, so we don't like, yeah, we have everything we want. Our demands are much more than. But think of you thrown into the Syrian war, where there's nothing of that sort, you're running out of everything. You have to survive. The little you get becomes your oasis. Like the boy had to live with the pigs and eat the pig's food. That became his supply. He valued what he had there at that moment of time. Because he had nothing else other than that little supply which was coming through. So when we are going through life's journey, it's important that we always understand that the little things we get, don't take it for granted. Bless the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank God for what we have right now in our nation. We are so blessed. Imagine, imagine someone living in a, a country which is a war, war with war. They don't have any, any proper supply coming through their way. Paul and Silas. Can someone say what was their oasis? How did they find the supply? What did they do to find their supply? In the, at, a time, at a time when they were beaten, thrown in jail, really down and out, what was it? Worship. They turned their situation into an oasis. They became a place through which the God could have supplied his presence into the people's lives. Isn't it amazing? Paul and Silas are beaten up, locked up, thrown in the prison. 
and they don't grumble, they don't murmur, they start worshipping the Lord. As they start worshipping the Lord, a supply of water starts coming through, meaning the presence of God comes through, the anointing comes through. As the anointing comes through, these guys start worshipping the Lord, and that presence of God changes the atmosphere. Even though it was a prison cell, it's supposed to be a place which is hard and not good. All their chains come off, the prison doors open, and then the prison guard is ready to kill himself, thinking these guys have escaped. But the prison guard and his family gave their hearts to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. So, when you're walking with the Lord in church, in church life, in, in your journey with the Lord, very often you come through hurdles. How many of you have had down times in serving the Lord? Hard times, right? When you're going through the hard time, what attitude you have is going to determine your oasis. When you're going through a hard time, it's not when the happy times. The happy times you have people to clap you through and encourage you and excite you and all that. But when you're going through a hard time, how do you turn your oasis on? Because if you don't, you can fall really badly down. But when you're going through a hard time, if you can turn to Jesus and just trust in Him, God will always send you someone to create an atmosphere which is going to be an oasis for you to continue to go on. We see Moses, when he fled Egypt, he goes into the desert. Forty years, he, what, what was his job? Looking after sheep. Who, whose sheep was he looking after? Jethro's, the father-in-law's. Now, when he's there, Moses had, he was like second in command in the palace. He was like so prominent and very well influential. But he has to flee from the palace into the desert. Now, in the desert, he creates his own little oasis. And he finds God in the desert. He meets Jesus, God's presence in the fire, fiery furnace. So, isn't that amazing? And so it's important for us to remember that when we are walking this journey with the Lord, that we always keep our hearts right. Our hearts right. Because this heart, if it's not right, it can turn the waters into bitterness. Or it can turn the waters into a good oasis. How many of you want to keep your heart as like a place where there's an oasis flowing through? Where people can look at you and say, Wow, look at this person. I never see that person upset. That person is always smiling. Always happy. You know, someone told me this. They said, happiness comes from happenings. But joy comes from the Lord. Happiness comes from happenings. Joy comes from the Lord. If you don't have the presence of God, you, like, I know we all have ups and downs, but to keep the right heart attitude, it's important that we have the presence of God. Because joy comes from the Lord. Happenings, is like sometimes you have to tell people things all the time, nice things, or do things for them to feel happy, feel happy, feel happy. But it's important that we come into that place where we have joy of the Lord is the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes, amen. Praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What's that? That is, He gives me living waters and I'll thirst no more. He gives me living waters and I thirst no more. He leaves me living waters and I thirst no more. For the joy of the Lord is my... Turn around and give a five high five to someone. Come on. Praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So the Lord is looking for the people whom he could trust to create an oasis so that the oasis in a desert will bring water 
and that water will bring green, bring trees and plants and bring life into that place. So in other words, the Lord wants his children to be life givers and we are called to be that. So I, I really believe we are coming into a season where God is going to pour out his spirit in such abundance into our lives that we are going to be welling up with this spring of water which is going to be shining out of us and people are going to come to us for a drink. They are going to say, I want, I want what that guy has. I want that what that lady has. Ah, I'm, I'm really excited. Look at her at works. Well, she's never upset. Look at her at school. Look at her at church. Look at her at the community. She's always happy. She's always smiling. I want something that she has or he has. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now Moses comes back and he takes the Israelites. And why did one of the main reasons Israel complained in the desert was what? No water. No water. And they come to a place called Mara, and the waters of Mara, it was an oasis. But the water was bitter. Do you know why the water was bitter in Ma waters of Mara was bitter? Because the people were murmuring. The word of God says, because the people were murmuring, the waters were bitter. I want to tell you, if you are feeling bitter, if you are carrying offense, if you are carrying a, 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 something in your heart, don't blame anyone else. Just get on your knees and cry to the Lord to help yourself. Because no one else can help you, you have to help your own self. You're, you're like, I was listening to, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 uh. John Bivier. John Bivier said once he was in a church and he was the assistant pastor of that church. <coughs> and he was going to that church and he was very supportive of the pastor. He was called, he started working for the pastor. He used to drive the pastor around. He used to do everything for the pastor. And uh, I think it was Benny Hinn, if I'm right, that he was working with. Yeah. And he said everything was going very well. But suddenly one day he began to think. Because people are getting around him and people are supporting him and all that. He began to think, wow, look how great I am. I think I can preach even better than my pastor. And then he started thinking all these different things. And he said he went into a spiral without knowing. He was starting to tell people, I'm not getting anything from church. I'm not getting anything from church. I'm not getting anything from church. Then he met some other people who had left the church and they told him, that's right, that's why we left the church because we're not getting anything from the church, we're not getting anything from the church. He started, this conversation continued until the Lord challenged him one day. The Lord told him, the problem is not Benny Hinn, the problem is you. And he said, Lord, why, why, why me? He said, look at your heart. Your heart, you're complaining against the man of God. So when your heart is bitter, you can't receive from that fountain. I love that. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, church, if your heart is bitter, you're not going to receive from that fountain because you're blocking your own, receive. what do you call it? What you can receive, you're blocking it yourself. He said, immediately, John Bivier said, he fell on his knees and repented and asked the Lord forgiveness and said, I'm going to go with a different heart to church this Sunday. After months and months of having this attitude, when he went to church that Sunday, he said he was so blessed. So blessed. So our heart can turn the waters bitter. It's not, it's not Peter, Paul and Mary and Anne who is causing me trouble. Pa, pa, Jesus, I can't go to that church because when I see so and so, when I see so and so, they upset me. Oh yeah, really? The Lord will tell you, come here, come here. They don't upset you. You are the person who is upset. Get your heart right. So, I, I remember a time where back in Sri Lanka. There was a time I was in leadership. I was very involved in the church. And uh, we had a certain problem. We were just married at that time. And the pastor basically told me that he's taking me off all leadership. And uh, I was really, really sad. But you know what we did? For more than a year, we went and sat in the church faithfully, very quietly. We did not gossip. We did not condemn. We did not pull down anyone. We just served the Lord. By doing nothing. We didn't do anything. Really, we just went to church. That's all. 
One year later, that pastor left. Another pastor came in to put back into leadership. So in your down times, remember to keep your heart right. Because it's important that you keep your heart right. The prodigal son kept his heart right. Even though he did something completely wrong, he left his father's house, he walked away, he went into the day, spent all his money, he was with the pigs, eating the pigs' food. <coughs> he, should, he humbled himself to think of this like this. He said, in my father's house, even their servants have much more than what I have. I'm not fit to be the son anymore. His heart was right. See that? He said, I'm not fit to be the son anymore. Let me go and ask him whether I can work as a servant in his house. We all make mistakes, church. We all have mistakes. How you deal with the problem is the important thing. If you have a stinking, thinking attitude, proud, pride, jealousy, these are absolute waters of Mara. Because they don't bring the pure fountain out. It brings bitterness out of you. But if you have a heart of forgiveness, love, affection and compassion, you can change the atmosphere. I can stand here and tell you honestly, there's been so much happened in my life, but I could honestly say from the bottom of my heart, I don't have any offense, I don't have any offense or bitterness towards anyone. I can kiss my worst enemy and say I love you because I love them. I genuinely love them. When the Islamic Council's president took me to court, put me through death threats, firebombing threats, kidnapping threats of my children, Dragged into court for five years, 40 days of court hearing. I see the Islamic Council's president coming to the courtroom one day with crutches and limping away with the plasters all over his legs. My heart was drawn with compassion for him. I felt so sorry for him. So I went up to him and I said, what happened to you? And I hugged him and kissed him. Okay? I didn't realize the age newspaper took a photograph. The next day it was in the papers, enemies hug each other outside the courtroom. But for me, it was like, even though he had taken me through such a hard time, I felt sorry for the guy. And I thank the Lord and I look back and say, thank God we had our right heart attitude. So it's this, this fountain has to be looked after very carefully because this is, can bring Bitter waters or pure waters? Elijah. We know Elijah was in the desert. On next month when you go to Israel, we will go to Mount Carmel and we'll have a service there. <coughs> what was Elijah's oasis? A woman, a widow. A widow became a supplier. He went and spoke to the widow as the Lord said and the woman basically produced, gave him to eat and drink. He was in the desert, he was all by himself, he was in trouble because, uh, what do you call it, Jezebel was wanting to kill him. He was in hiding. One could turn around and say, Lord, you told Elijah to go and confront Ahab. He did what you told him to do. Now Jezebel is going to kill him. Why can't you protect him? I was asking these questions, why Lord? Why do you let Elijah go through that trial? Why does God let us go through what we go through? Can someone tell me why? Why do you think God lets us go through hard times? Character building. It is absolutely character building. If you don't go through your tough times, you will never be able to know what it is to be in that place. Once you go through that, you can stand strong. So sometimes it's very hard. When you, you know, we all love... Thanks, Yvonne. We all love to be happy, lucky, eating chocolates and ice, ice cream. Go to church, come back, and everything will be, she'll be right, might. But I want to tell you, she's not right, might. She's in deep trouble right now, might. 
what we need is a good kick on our blessed assurance to get us off our seats and get us on our knees and start working harder. What do, you, what, what do they say? They say a person who has nothing to do minds everyone else's business. I have no time for anyone else's business. I have time to just spend time with the Lord. And it's important, it's important that we really connect into the presence of the Lord. The church, we are moving into an amazing season in the Lord right now. Praise God. I thank the Lord for the opportunities He's giving us. So Elijah's supply was a woman. She became his oasis. So when you're going through a hard time, don't expect things to be as it was before. It might be a different circumstances. The prodigal son's oasis was a big sty for a while. But then because he had this heart right, he came back to the house. And when he comes home, the father is waiting for him. And the father says, come son. He says, no, no father, I'm not fit to be your son. The father gets a, has a big feast, has a barbecue, or a spit roast or whatever. And they're having a party, and the brother comes home. The brother had been at home all the time. But when he comes home, he sees the uh, brother who had left come back, and the father is having a big party. So he uh, asks the son, what's happening? And they said, your brother who left has come back. So guess what happens to this guy? He gets upset. He gets uh, get angry. He says, I was in the house, and I didn't have a party. Why is my brother having a party? Why I'm saying this is this important? First, to understand this. Who are we to judge anyone? Who are we to judge anyone? When those who have gone come back, let's love them. Let's, let's, I mean, the prodigal son came back, his father waited for him to come back. It's important that we love them, receive them, bless them, and let our hearts be right. Very important. Praise God. Moses, why did Moses did not? Why didn't Moses enter the promised land? What was the reason that Moses didn't enter the promised land? Because he hit the rock. Why did he hit the rock? Because the people provoked him to a place of complaining, 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 complaining that he was getting so frustrated. He hit the rock when God said, speak to the rock. Be very careful when you're in your downtime, when you're going through a hard time. What comes out of your mouth has to be very, very, very careful. Because what comes out of this can set a whole town on fire. It can start wars, it can destroy lives. But if you keep your hearts right, you will enter the promised land. Moses did not enter the promised land. After making the journey for 40 years, he dies on Mount. What was that called? What's the mountain? Moriah. Moriah, Moriah I, think. I think so. So people of God, let's keep our hearts right all the time. We are coming into a time where offense is going to be very easy to be, uh, what do you call it, people are going to easily offend us. We can't try to justify ourselves by saying, I didn't do anything, they did everything wrong. It's not going to help. It can be pastors, it can be myself, it can be... I don't know, it can be your husband, it can be your wife, it can be anyone. The important thing is to keep your waters clean. Keep your heart right, so that if your heart is right, you will be right. And if you are right, the nation will be on the right track to see God's glory. Amen. Worship team, can you come please? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Close your eyes and bow your heads right now. I want to ask you a question this morning. Is there anyone here who can 
think of. Just think for a moment. Is there any reason that you could have your waters like the waters of Mara? Your fountain cannot produce clear water. Your fountain cannot be an oasis, rather than it's been a piece of bitter water where you are not functioning with God's full capacity. If you think that there is something like that, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just put your hands up and put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else who is saying, I believe there are some areas in my life which I let should not be there, which is causing me to be my waters. My oasis is turning into bitterness. So the waters are bitter. Anyone else? One more opportunity before I pray for you for breakthrough. Father, right now, I pray for every single person who put their hands up, Lord. I pray, Lord, that the waters will not be bitter like the waters of Mara. The people of Israel journeyed through the desert and they grumbled every time. Three days they had gone without water after crossing the Red Sea. And as they came to this place where there was an oasis, where they thought there was water that they can enjoy, but when they went to taste the water, the water was bitter. And they couldn't drink the water. And your word says the water was bitter because the people were grumbling and murmuring. Father, help us to stop grumbling and murmuring. Help us to rejoice and praise you. It's not about what someone did to me. It's what about my how, how am I reacting to that. Help us to keep our hearts right, Lord. So that this oasis will flow and people will come to the Lord. Father, I thank you for Israel, which is an oasis in a desert land. You have blessed that land because that's your land. I pray that you bless our land because this is your land. Bless us, Lord, because we are your children. Yes. Father, I commit everyone here into your hands this morning. I pray a mighty blessing upon them, blessing upon everyone who is watching us, wherever they are watching us from. Help us to be an oasis, Lord, where we will create life in barren and dry lands. In Jesus' name, Amen. Can we sing the song, I believe you are my healer? Sing this song for healing in the land, for the barrenness to disappear, and for the healing to flow through. Thank you, Jesus.
you sent your word and healed my disease you are the god my healer father we thank you father this morning we pray also lord regarding the same sex marriage lost lord father we cancel the enemy's plans for our nation father we pray that the yes word will fail and no word will prevail the no word will be overwhelmingly a victory lord father we ask for 60 70 80% lord amen it be a massive blow to the enemy's camp amen father we just pray that the no word will successful and same sex marriage will not be legalized in australia Father, we cancel all the enemy's plans for our nation. We declare Australia for Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, when we finish the service, I will appreciate if you can go and have a cup of cuppa and a biscuit or whatever in the kitchen. But keep the volume down a bit because we're going to do a recording in my office. And I'll appreciate you not making too much noise so that it does not get distracted. Thank you. God bless you. Ooh.